Sunday afternoon if we have to to baptize all the people getting saved. Amen? And if we don't see that, uh, I'm going to be disappointed. And let's keep praying uh, for those who are in life transition. And God is just good all the time. How often is God good? All the time. All the time. Amen. Let's fellowship with one another. I took some extra time. Won't take you long. Okay. Thank you for being here. Amen. <laughs>
Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today once again recognizing that all that we have comes from you. You are the giver of all that we have. And Lord, you are mighty God. You are creator of all that is. You are savior, sustainer, and soon coming prince of peace. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. And so, Lord, we bring our tithes and offerings to you. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray that you would take it and use it to bring glory to your name, to lift up the name of Jesus so that men and women and boys and girls of every creed and culture can come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Lord, we're not asking you to bless our church today. We're asking you to bring in the kingdom of God through your bride. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Set the ark of the covenant where the most high and only the high priest could enter there to offer up the sacrifice for atonement for sin. But the veil. In an instant, revealing that holy place on a hill nearby, on a rugged cross, justice met grace. Now I can go into the
Amen. Thank you, Brother Allen and choir. We are so blessed to have Brother Allen and our choir, aren't we? And what a wonderful job. Enjoyed that. And, and it, did you listen real closely to the words of that song? If I could get 100% of you to shake your heads, I wouldn't even have to preach. Amen. <laughs> That was so well matched with the sermon. And so you listen to how we get to that place and see if God speaks to your heart. Uh, you're well aware, I, I don't think there's anybody here that uh, probably not heard my introduction about uh, watching this game show about Will, uh, the real Alan Martin, please stand up. And... Uh, we're asking the real church to stand up because Jesus established the church. Uh, we, we read that the church was left here to do, uh, to continue the, everything that Jesus both began to do and teach. And so he brought the church into existence to evangelize the world, to disciple believers, and to minister to the hurting. Jesus loved the church so much that he died for the church. Husbands are told in Paul's writing that we are to love our wives as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? He gave his life for it. And so we are asked uh, to love our brides that much. And so we're to love the bride of Christ enough, as, or at least we should love the church so much that like Jesus, we would be willing to give our life to the church and surrender our will for our church to God's will for our church. Amen? The reason we have so many denominations and so many different churches on every corner and up every holler and up every little nook and cranny along the creek banks is because people want their own way at church. And so Baptists have have uh, grown in the number of churches we have through division, but the Bible teaches us to grow through multiplication. Whenever we get a believer to believe Jesus Christ and then disciple them and minister to hurting people so we have an open door to share Jesus with them. So we need to love Christ so much that we love his church so much that we're willing to give up our will for our church in order that God's will for our church can happen. We've looked at the real church had a rocky start. We looked at the church then as the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, the family of God, the army of God, God's building. And last week we talked about the fact, uh, Brother Paul, that the real church lives by the book, by the book. And today we want to look at the fact that the real church is where everyone is a priest. Everybody is a priest. And we're going to have to talk about that and see where we're at. But 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 is our verse of the day. And if you're physically able to stand to honor the reading of the Word of God, would you please join me in standing? And let's open up the Word of God and read together 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy, set-apart nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your inspired inerrant word the holy bible help us lord not just to focus on memorizing what it says but may the main focus while memorization is the first step help us not end there but help us to make the main focus is the application of the teaching of the word of god in our heart and life in our homes with our family in our workplaces, in our church. And Lord, that we can become that royal priesthood, royal blood of Jesus coursing through our veins, the royal blood of Jesus 
covering our sin. The royal blood of Jesus, Lord, that bought the life of the martyrs of the church. And may we be willing to die, Lord, to our own will, that your will may be accomplished. In Jesus' name, we pray that you would speak through your chosen pastor today and speak the word of truth, a word with power, and Lord, a word that brings glory to Jesus, a word that draws sinners to the Savior. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. I hear a lot of people talking today about what a different world that we live in. And I know what they're talking about because I feel much the same way. The world we live in today in America is not the world I grew up in, where the door was never latched, let alone have a deadbolt, a second lock on the door, never have a burglar alarm, park the tractor, the old Alice Chalmers, WD-45, it was, you know what? It was absolutely, didn't have no key. Uh, it had a magneto. When we first got it, you had to crank it up like the old cars. And we cr changed it all over to 12 volt. And, and man, we were proud you could just get up there and pull on that starter. And that thing crank right up with the help of a battery and a and a generator and you know what didn't have to worry about where you parked it if you left it down in what we called the well field or over in the deep woods or wherever you left it nobody wasn't going to bother your Alice Chalmers or anything else you had on the farm it was a different day so I know what people are talking about but do you know it's also the fact that humanity today is not much different than it's always been Humanity, ever since the Garden of Eden, has been sinners. We're still sinners today. And man has always felt that they couldn't approach God, and today many people feel the same way, that they can't approach God. Man's always found it more comfortable to let somebody else do that for them. They always wanted to have a priest around, or a witch doctor, or a medicine man to approach God on their behalf the priesthood though as far back as we can read in history the priesthood has always existed in other religions long before it did in the hebrew religion the levitical priesthood of judaism the bible tells us that abraham gave tithes to melchizedek uh, who was a priest of the most high god moses when he fled egypt because uh, that he had murdered that man who was belittling and harming one of his Hebrew brothers. When he fled, he went to a land of Midian. And who did he find there? He married the daughter of a, the priest of Midian. So priesthood, long before the time of Jesus, was well entrenched into the thinking of the Hebrew people. The temple was the primary place. That's not the choir sang that beautiful song about it. It was the primary place in Jewish life, and at the heart of temple worship was the inner sanctuary where God dwelled. And it consisted of a very large room consisted, uh, divided by this huge veil. If you can imagine this, the little church that I grew up in, uh, we didn't have cantatas and all that sort of stuff, but we did have Christmas programs, Okay. And there was a wire. I always wondered, you know, why this wire stretched across the front. And whenever it got Christmas time, they'd snap bed sheets sewed together on that, on that wire. Now, some of you all look at me like, boy, I didn't know we got this country bumpkin to be our pastor. And, and so somebody would have somebody assigned to this curtain and somebody assigned to that curtain, and we'd have our Christmas program. But it was just a little old bed sheet. I'm sure it was the cheapest bed sheet Scarlet, they could find uh, because we didn't uh, have a lot of money in that little church and didn't give a lot of money in that little church. And as a matter of fact, people who was in that church didn't have much money. 
and so we may do but you know I'm convinced that if I went there and they had that little sheet today that as weak as I am that I could have taken one of those bed sheets and ripped it apart if I wanted to but the temple uh, that inner sanctuary was divided by this great veil 60 feet long by 30 feet wide but the kicker is this it was three inches thick three inches thick you go back and read God's instructions for putting this together and on one side of the veil was the holy place and on the other side of that veil was the holy of holies and the average person like me and you well we couldn't go to either one of those places we couldn't go to the holy place nor could we go to the holy of holies but we could go into according to how we were classified into the gentile court or the women's court or to the Israelite court but never could we get any closer to God than that but the priest would go daily into the holy place on one side of that big three inch by 60 foot by 30 foot curtain and daily he would go offer sacrifices for the people into the holy place but once a year the high priest would go into the holy of holies where God dwelled. If he was clean, he could go in. If he was ceremonially clean, he could go in. And once a, a year, he would offer a blood sacrifice for the sins of the people on the Day of Atonement. So one of the miracles that occurred when Jesus was crucified on the cross was that three inch thick by 60 foot long by 30 inch wide veil that separated the holy place and the holy of holies it was torn in two from top to bottom from top to bottom and Matthew says in the 27th chapter and when Jesus had cried out let's look at that on the screen on that slide had cried out again in a loud voice he gave up his spirit when Jesus gave up life human life at that moment when Jesus died on the cross for your sins and mine the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom so here's the picture this three inch thick veil wasn't torn by man God reached down from heaven and tore that veil from top to bottom and symbolized the fact that Jesus' death on the cross opened the way into the presence of God for all people. Count them. A-L-L, all people. Equal access had arrived. Look at the next slide, Ephesians 2, 18. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. So what does it mean? It means that through Jesus Christ, every believer can now come to God. It means that the Levitical priests are no longer needed. It means that in Christianity, pastors are to provide leadership, but they are not priests in the old sense of the word. This means that while pastors and staff ministers may perform priestly functions and call upon to do that as a believer, they have no power to intercede for you or anyone else that doesn't belong to every other believer. This means that the New Testament church does not have an official priest. It means that there's no second class members in the New Testament church. It means that we all have equal access to God. There are no ordinary Christians. We're all royalty, and the scriptures declare it. Look at Revelation chapter 5, 10 on this next slide. Read that and highlight it part with me, would you please? You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on earth. I'll tell you from beginning to end, it took the blood, amen? And the New Testament teaches that every Christ follower is appointed a priest and we have direct access to God through the mediation of Christ without needing an earthly priest. And so here's the question we want to answer today. What does all that mean? 
What does all that mean? Let's look at the next slide. It says this, is in the real church, everyone's a priest. So what? What does that mean to you? What does that mean to me? Well, the first thing that it means, we see on the next slide, it means, it, it gives us this, that the fact that everyone's a priest means that everyone can connect with God without a human intermediary. Look at the fifth verse of that second chapter of First Peter on the next slide with me. And just read the highlighted words. Skip those others. You are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. And let me finish that. Offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. It means we're free to approach God. It means we're free to believe the gospel. It means we're free to reject the gospel. It means that we're free to pray directly to God. It means that we're free to confess our own sins. It means that we are free as churches to govern our own church. It means that we're free to interpret scriptures for ourselves. However, listen, we cannot believe anything and still be a people called Baptist. This does not mean we have a license to misinterpret the Scripture, to explain away the Scripture, or to pick and choose what to believe. But if we use proper methods of interpretation and exegeting Scripture, we have the right, every one of us, to interpret the scripture for ourselves. As a matter of fact, we read in Jude's epistle on this next slide, it says, Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to who? To the saints. Amen. The body of Christian faith was given to us full and complete. It needs no additions, and guess what? It allows for no subtraction. With the exceptional growth of human knowledge in the world, the gospel hasn't changed one bit. We've got a lot of artificial intelligence controversy going on today. I don't know about you, but I just want real intelligence, amen? I've always wanted that, and I've never found much of it in my own mind. I've found intellectuals and people that are really smart. But I don't need any artificial intelligence. That's for certain. But with the growth of human knowledge, the gospel hasn't changed. Not one nary a bit. Got that? I don't know if that's just the way Festa said it on Gunsmoke or not. I was trying it real hard. All right, some of you don't even know what gun smoke is, let alone Festus. Every generation needs to study and find contemporary ways of communicating the same old truth and applying it in the world today. But there's nothing to be added to it. Nothing can be taken from that truth. So the fact that everyone is a priest means that everyone you and me can connect to God without a human intermediary. And also it means this. You see it on the slide there in front of you. That we are under obligation to offer spiritual sacrifices to God for ourselves. Again in verse 5. Look at it with me on the next slide. You also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. And look what it says we're to do offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So he is our high priest, according to the book of Hebrews. So Peter realized that the sinless Son of God had been offered once and for all sacrifice upon the cross of Calvary for our sins. And according to the writer of Hebrews, never again, never again would man have to offer up the blood of bulls and goats to atone for their sin. Look at Hebrews 9, 28 with me, would you please? So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people, and he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So God hasn't abolished the principle of sacrifice in true worship. 
He's merely changed the form of the sacrifice to a spiritual sacrifice. What are the spiritual sacrifices? What does that mean, Pastor? Well, look on, on the next slide. We find out there's the sacrifice of repentance. The sacrifices of God are, would you read it with me? A broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. So there's the sacrifice of repentance. And then also in true worship, there's the sacrifice of praise. Look with me at Hebrews 13, 15. Through Jesus, therefore, read it with me, please. Let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. And then third, there's the sacrifice of our possessions. Look with me at the 16th verse of Hebrews 13. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. So there's those three and one more, but the sacrifice of repentance, the sacrifice of praise, the sacrifice of our possessions, and then finally, the sacrifice of ourselves. Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, would you read it with me? To offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. The fact that everyone is a priest means that everyone can connect with God without a human mediator. And it also, the fact that everyone is a priest means that we're under obligation to offer spiritual sacrifices to God for ourselves. And the third one is already on the screen. You see it there with me. The fact that everyone's a priest means that we have the responsibility to bring other people to God, other people to God. Let's look once again at 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen people. And then would you read that last highlighted part with me? That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So we are to connect men with God. We must realize that we will, or I want you to hear this. If you don't hear nothing else I say today, we must realize that we will never win our world to Christ by simply attending church and working on the church campus through its programs. Did you hear what I said? We'll never win the world to Christ by simply attending church and going, jumping through the hoops of the church programs. One old pastor I knew as I grew up in the ministry said this was like fishing in a rain barrel. Do you remember what a rain barrel is? My grandmother Wiley had a rain barrel. The gutter off the house went down into this big wooden barrel and she no longer used it for anything but the barrel was still there when I was just a boy. Now she had running water in the house, believe it or not. But she had this barrel that caught all of the rainwater and, and playing that as, as we might, my cousins nor I ever found a fish in that rain barrel. You could have fished there all day long and never caught a fish. And so that old pastor said that, that coming to church and doing the programs of the church was like fishing in a rain barrel. You could enjoy the fishing, but you'd never catch anything. And so that means we must busy ourselves not with programs, but we must busy ourselves with people. We must allow our lives to be interrupted with the needs and the hurts and the pain and the lostness of people that our lives intersect. We must take the time to be their intermediary. We must take the time to pray that God would put them on our heart and that we could share the good news of Jesus and what he means in our heart and life and how we came to know him as Savior with those people. We need to stop fishing in the rain barrel. And we need to get out into the water that's teeming with fish and need to go a fishing. We need to go a fishing where the fish are. Every Christian this side of heaven needs to be concerned about every lost person this side of hell. And the only way we can do that is to get out of the church and let our lives be bothered with people that need Jesus. And as our own priest, 
we must come to God for ourselves for salvation. Debbie and I were in a meeting in Franklin, Tennessee, Monday night, where a loving pastor stood up and shared his testimony at the behest of Dr. Randy Davis. He got up and shared his testimony that just a few weeks ago he came to realize that he had been a part of the team for all these years. He'd even went to seminary and he was a pastor, but he was as lost as he could be, and he got saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I'm telling you, the church can't save you. Getting your name on the church roll doesn't save you, doesn't take you to heaven. If you did not ask Jesus with a broken heart and a contrite spirit to forgive you and plead with him to, act, to absolve you of your sins, the church can't absolve your sins. Only Jesus can save the unsaved. Amen? So we must come to God for ourselves, for salvation. Salvation by proxy through mama, daddy, grandma, grandpa, through the preacher doesn't exist. No one can do this for us. And spectator religion doesn't get us in a right relationship with Christ. You can call yourself evolved for life by just attending the games and cheering on the good games and the good years and belittling the coach and those young men who make up the team on the bad Saturdays and the bad years. You can belittle them. You can have all the answers. And you can call yourself a ball for life. And you can sit in the stands of the stadium and think that you're really connected and that you are a fan. But I want to tell you something. A fan is a fanatic. A fan is a fan in the bad years as well as the good years. Whether you're at the University of Kentucky and you're a wildcat or where you're a volunteer from Tennessee or somewhere else, I want to tell you something. You can call yourself whatever you want, but in the same way, you can sit in the pews of the church and call yourself a Christian. And you can clap and applaud when the church is doing good and you can criticize and belittle when the numbers are low and the giving is down. But that doesn't make you a Christian because you call yourself a Christian. The only person that is a Christian is the person that has come to Christ broken because of their sins and received the forgiveness of sins and had the blood of the cross cover our sins. So no one else can choose Jesus for you. We're free to choose. And the choice is ours. The responsibility goes with the privilege. No one else can stop you. The Bible teaches that the final responsibility for our relationship with God rests squarely on our own soldiers. We're all our own priests unto God. And there's no one who can make that decision for you. Our final act as a priest must be to offer our life to the Lord. Paul said it this way in 2 Timothy chapter 4 on this next slide. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have kept finished, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. And henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And then he goes on to say, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. So in the real church, everyone's a priest. Let's look at the next slide. Let's ask that question. In the real church, everyone's a priest. What difference does it make? We said that everyone can connect with God. Look at that as you click that button one more time, my brother. There you go. Everyone can connect with God without a human intermediary. And as we look at the next reason, we are under obligation to offer spiritual sacrifices to God for ourselves. And thirdly, we have the responsibility to bring other people to God. And that just brings us down to the fact that the real church, in the real church, every 
person is a priest. And so I'm asking you today, if you've been to Jesus for the cleansing power, if you've been and received the blood of the Lamb, if your sins are spotless because of the blood of Jesus, then you're part of the church and you're a real priest. You're your own priest and you're a priest to connect other people to God. And we have an obligation, a responsibility that comes with that freedom to connect other people to Jesus Christ. And I'm asking you right now, as the message ends, will the real church please stand up? I want us to pray together. I want us to consider the message that God has given us today from his word. Are we being priests in the sense that we are connecting other people to Jesus Christ? Are you praying right now like our golden offering? Day eight, prayer request, that God would put somebody on our heart that we could share the gospel with today, this week, and every day the rest of our lives. That's the way the real church connects Jesus and connects the real world to the real Jesus in the real church. Let's pray together and then listen closely as we sing our hymn of invitation. Is God inviting you? Is God inviting you or me to stand up and accept the responsibility of being a priest in this world, connecting God to the people and the people to God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the day you've given us, for this word from your word. Holy Spirit, we pray that, God, you would speak to my heart and the heart of everyone here right now, and that as decisions are made in my heart and the life of everyone who hears this message, God, would we stand up as the real church and be the real deal the real priest, connecting real lost people to the real Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Would you stand with me, please? The altar is open for prayer, or if you want to come and join the church, and you're not a member of the church, we're taking members today take you under the watch care of the church just like that amen we'd love for you to come if you're here today though and you're saying well i'm a member of the church or i'm a member of a church somewhere but i'm just not sure that i can trace the line back and that i've ever told god i was sorry for my sin and asked him to save me because of what jesus did on the cross of Calvary. And I want to nail that down today. Or you may be a member of this church. You may be sure you're saved, but you don't feel like you've been a priest unto God connecting people to Jesus. And you want to come and make that decision today, that commitment to living up to your priestly role in the kingdom of God. His royal blood now flows through our veins. And we have the gospel, the good news, that Jesus died for our sins and that whosoever will may come and drink of the water of life freely. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's our responsibility. That's our task. That's what we're asking you to commit to today. Would you do it in Jesus' name while we sing?
Amen. If you know for sure you're saved today, would you raise your hand right now? Amen. The light of the world is Jesus. You're the light of the world. Go ye into all the world that everybody else can see Jesus. Amen. That's the commission. That's the call. And I know no other gospel to preach other than that gospel. And we're going to either uh, do it, I'm going to do it, or I'm not going to do it. I have the choice. I can decide. You're either going to do it or you're not going to do it. I'm either saved or I'm not. You're either saved or you're not. And only we as priests unto God can know that. Amen. And Jesus died so that all can be saved. So that all can be saved. It's not his will that any would perish, but that all would come to eternal life. Would you say amen to that? Amen. amen. Tonight, I am a church member, final, final night, unless I just decide to start teaching again next Sunday. Now, I haven't decided, but it's final night. So I hope you'll come back. And you'll be a part of that final night of our study. May God bless you. May God keep you. May God send us to the nations. And that nation starts right outside these doors. May we be his priests unto the people that he has sent us to serve. Amen. Let's sing a verse of a song to be dismissed. Hope to see you tonight. Thank you for being here. If you're our guest today. Come back and see us. We love you. We want you to come. We need you. If you're a Christian and a believer, we'll put you to work for the kingdom if you're willing to share the gospel. Amen? Six o'clock.